everyone, I'm Rick and welcome back to Maple Syrup Gaming. Today, we're going to be taking a look at another Nintendo Switch controller review, more specifically, the PowerAway Wireless Enhanced Edition. Now, about a month ago, I posted a poll in the channel asking what should be the next controller I purchase for the channel, and well, this was the winner. And not only did I purchase one controller, I actually purchased two versions of the same controller. Now there is a specific reason when we're going to get to the testing why I ordered two different versions of the same controller and it's going to come back to one of the same reasons that I pointed to for the wired edition of this controller. The D-pad from one version to another does vary quite a bit but we'll get to that in the testing. Now if this is your first time on the channel let me give you a brief breakdown of how I do my reviews. First of all, we're going to start with a close-up of the controller where we're going to basically go through all its functions and basically see really up close what the controller has to offer. Then we're going to go through a scoring process. And not only do we score the aesthetics, the feel and the build quality of the controller, but I actually go through specific gameplay testing in four different categories, really giving you which categories this controller is best at and which are maybe its weaker points. If you ever want any more information about that, I have a specific video that goes into a lot of details into my testing process. It's on the channel. You can watch it, but you'll get pretty much everything you need to know out of this review. And lastly, just before we get started on the close-up, I want to remind all of you to not forget to like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you aren't already, and also I always leave affiliate links in the description of the video down below. So if you want to pick up those controllers, feel free to use those links. Now. Let's move on to the close-up. Now, I always like to take a quick look at the box, just so that if you're looking for this controller on store shelves, you know what to look for. Basically, this box really puts the controller at the forefront with a windowed view. So normally you actually see the controller right here at the front. Also, they do a lot of branding. Basically, a Power A is one of the controllers I find that they make the most variety of controllers and they have a lot of licenses like Spyro the Dragon, like Zelda Breath of the Wild and whatnot. They also really identify that basically the controller comes equipped with two uh, macro buttons at the back and it has wireless motion control. So then if we take a look at the side of the box, you get a couple of beauty shots on each side showing you different sides of the controller. And finally at the back, you basically get a description of the main functions of the controller as well as basically a breakdown of how to program the buttons, as well as the fact that the macro buttons can be programmed to every one of the face buttons, including the D-pad itself. But we're gonna get to those functions when we look at the controller itself. So enough with the box, let's look at the star of the show, let's look at that controller. So just for ease, other than for comparison's sake at the end, we're gonna be using the Spyro controller primarily for the overview. So if we start with just the general feel of the controller, this is a little bit larger than the official Pro Controller. It's made for a slightly larger hands. In my case, it actually feels a little bit more comfortable than the actual Pro Controller. However, shape-wise, it is very reminiscent of that Pro Controller. So it has the same overall feel, although, like I said, just a little bit larger. The controller itself also has some decent weight to it, feeling good in your hands, but it's not quite as heavy, once again, as the actual Pro Controller. First, if we start with the joysticks, they're nice and responsive and they have, they're just the right mix of tight enough where they flip back quickly, but at the same time, don't offer you too much resistance where they just feel awkward in game. For the Y, X, B and A button, what I like is they actually have a matte finish, not a glossy finish, which I prefer for these buttons, just because when you get a little bit sweaty and whatnot, those glossy finishes, sometimes they start slipping a little bit. The rest of the face buttons are just standard. You've got your plus minus home and capture button, nothing special there. Now I will get back to the D-pad just a little bit later because I do want to make a comparison with the other version of this controller that I have. Lastly, if we look at the trigger buttons at the top, they are nice and clicky triggers both at the front and back, basically meaning that they're digital triggers, not analog triggers. Either way, for the Nintendo Switch, you don't need those analog triggers because the Switch doesn't actually recognize analog inputs. And I really prefer these type of triggers on the Switch rather than having those false analogs like some other controllers out there. If we look at the back of the controller now, this is where we start having two surprise features. Number one, 
This controller has programmable macro buttons, basically on left and right side of the controller, and the program button for it is right here in the center. Now the second surprise some people might actually see as a downside, but this controller doesn't operate on a uh, built-in rechargeable batteries. It uses actually two double A's to power the controller. Now I myself use rechargeable batteries, so I actually don't see this as too much of a downside. Like if you already have rechargeable batteries at home, I actually prefer swapping out a couple of batteries really quick that takes two minutes than having to plug your controller in and play with it plugged in while it charges. But that's an individual choice that you're going to have to make of which one feels better to you. Some people are gonna see this as a downside and a, you know, not as valuable as having a built-in rechargeable battery. However, for myself, it's not a deal breaker, but it is something that is very important to notice because I've seen a lot of people pick up these controllers and then try to return them to the store because they find out that they're battery operated and they don't have a built-in rechargeable battery. Now I brought the second controller into focus because we're gonna talk about that D-pad. So basically, depending on the aesthetic model you chose of the controller, you're gonna get two different types of D-pads. Either you're gonna get a matte finished D-pad like on the spiral controller, or you're gonna get a glossy metallic finished D-pad like you have here on my Zelda Breath of the Wild version. Now for someone who doesn't play a lot of platformers or fighting games that use primarily the D-pad, either version is probably gonna feel just fine to you. However, if you do play a lot of fighting games or a lot of platformers, I strongly recommend that you tend towards a model with a matte D-pad just because the finish on the glossy metallic version is so rough that basically I was getting calluses and fighting games on my thumb after a few hours of playing because the sides of that D-pad are so rough. And also the D-pad on the matte version just seems a little bit tighter in the socket and a little bit more responsive. So it's just something I wanna throw out there when you're choosing your version of this controller, if you do pick, decide to pick one up. Really, if you're looking at playing a lot of platformers or fighting games that use the D-pad, try to get one with a matte D-pad. If you're not into that and you're aesthetically more attracted to a version with a metallic D-pad, go for it. But just be aware of that one, I find major important difference between the different styles of this controller. Now the last thing, and we've discussed about a few, let's do a quick breakdown of the features of this controller. So primarily it's a wireless controller. Number two, it is battery operated. It does not have an integrated uh, rechargeable battery. Number three, it has programmable macro buttons at the back. And lastly, it has full motion control. What it does not have, however, that the official Pro Controller does have, it does not have rumble in any form or fashion. And it also, uh, unfortunately, does not read Amiibo, so it doesn't have NFC compatibility. So just a quick overview of the syncing process of this controller. Basically, this syncs very much like the official Pro Controller. You basically go to your controllers, to your change grip order, you hold down, there's a syncing button right here at the top. You hold it down for a couple of seconds and the controller will sync up directly with your switch as it just has. Another quick question to answer. A lot of people wonder this about the different wireless controllers. Yes, this controller does wake up your switch. So if you press the home button, once the controller synced, you don't actually have to go and physically open up, turn your switch on. The, uh, it does wake the switch up. So last thing, we're just gonna go really quickly through the process of uh, basically programming those macro buttons. So basically you're gonna hold the program button down a couple of seconds. The light at the front here will start flashing. At that point, you quickly choose the button you want the macro to become. For example, the Y button here, and you press the macro button at the back you want it to become. And now, as you see, the right macro button here at the back has become my Y button. When you want to remove the programming, you just hold down that programming button for a couple of seconds again till your light starts flashing. But this time you press directly the macro button and now the macro button is unprogrammed. As you can see, no more inputs are, being, are going in. So now that we've gone through all the main features of this controller, I think we're ready for the scoring. 
And as usual, we start with the overall feel and build quality of the controller. And this controller is going to be scoring a very solid 4 out of 5. Now, why is this controller getting a 4 out of 5? Well, it's a controller that is very well built and it feels very good in hand. However, it is not perfect. There is a slightly lower build quality than the, than the official Nintendo Switch Pro controller. And also, although I think it was an aesthetic decision by Powerade, I would have really liked to see textured grips at least at the back of the controller at the right and left side. Honestly, having this uniform finish is fine, but it just doesn't feel as good as if you had those textured grips on the controller. But other than that, for me, this controller feels really solid in hand. And if you like a slightly larger controller than the official Nintendo Switch Pro controller, something closer to an Xbox One controller, well, you'll be very happy with this Powerade controller. Now, for our next category, we're going to be talking about aesthetics and features of this controller. And unfortunately, it's only going to be scoring a 6 out of 10. Now, figuring out why it's scoring that 6 out of 10, however, is actually quite easy. Because although it has some very nice features, it is missing a few. So number one, as I said earlier, it's missing the NFC. It also unfortunately doesn't have the rumble and it doesn't have a built-in rechargeable battery. And although for me, that's not a negative, a huge negative point, I am reducing the score by one point for the absence of that built-in battery because for a lot of people out there, it will be a negative. However, what is saving this controller is the aesthetics for one. Like the Powerade controllers come in a huge variety of models and aesthetically, I think they're among the most vivid, detailed aesthetics out there. So it's actually scoring an extra two points for those characteristics. And also it has those programmable macro buttons at the back, which is a feature that I really, really like on controllers. And I'm actually disappointed that Nintendo didn't even throw that into their official pro controller for the price they're selling it. And it's just too bad because Powerade could have really knocked it out the park. I would have actually really liked them to maybe integrate Turbo on the controller. Just having Turbo as well would have really pushed this controller to a different level. But overall, it's still a solid offering feature-wise. Now, we finally get to the most important sections, the gaming reviews. And as usual, we're going to start with action and FPS games. Now for this category, the controller is going to be scoring a really solid 9.5 out of 10. Now why is it scoring so strong in this category? Well, its features are really geared towards this type of gaming. Those programmable macro buttons are ideal for FPS and action games. Also the clicky responsive triggers and the nice tight joysticks are really ideal for gaming in this category and the fact that no matter which model you get, the D-pad is generally not a deal breaker in this category. It's not losing any points for that as well. And the lack of turbo functionality or rumble is not really gonna hurt you that much for FPS and action games. I mean, the rumble would be nice to have and it's the reason pretty much this controller isn't scoring a perfect score, but it's not gonna destroy your gameplay feeling either. Now we get to my second category of gaming, and it's actually one of my favorites, 2D side-scrollers or traditional platforming games. And in this category, the controller is going to be getting an 8.5 out of 10. Now this is actually a combined score between the two type of D-pads. If you're playing with the metallic D-pad, I would have scored this controller an 8. However, if you're playing with the matte D-pad, I would score this controller a 9, giving it an average of 8.5 overall. Now don't get me wrong, the D-pad is nice and responsive, however, just for that comfort level, that's why it's losing the point on the metallic finished version, but overall, if over time you get used to the D-pad, pretty much both models for platforming are going to be pretty decent. However, the lack of a turbo function would really help in a lot of platforming games, especially if you're a huge Mega Man fan. And the macro buttons don't help you out as much in a lot of these games, but they do in some, so it is, you know, pushing that controller a little bit higher on that front. But basically, if this is your main category of gaming, do yourself a favor and pick up the matte version of the D-pad. You'll be much happier gaming with that version. 
Now we get to the third category of gaming, traditional 2D fighters. And in this category, this controller is once again going to be scoring a combined score of 8. Now if you are playing on the matte version, this controller would be getting an 8.5. If you're playing on the metallic version, this controller would go all the way down to a 7 for this category, which gives it roughly an average around 8. Now the face buttons and the triggers are nice responsive and clicky. They also have a very short travel distance, so it is great for fighting games on that end. However, as I said earlier, in this category, even more than the previous one for platformers, it is very important that if this is one of your main gaming categories, get yourself a matte D-pad. After a few hours of gameplay, as I said earlier, I was getting bad calluses on my thumbs and it was actually hurting to keep playing those games with the metallic version just because of that rough finish on that D-pad. And the matte version has a pretty decent D-pad, but it is not the best one out there. So at the same time, if this is the primary category you game in, this is maybe not the ideal controller for you. Now our last category that we're going to be looking at are racing and racing kart games. So we're talking about our Mario Karts, our Crash Team Racing, and all those type of games. And in this category, the controller is going to be scoring a very decent 8.5 out of 10. Now for the reasons of the score, well, it's pretty simple. This controller feels really good in hand. It has the motion controls you need if you'd like to play that way in these games. However, at the same time, it can't get a higher score because it is lacking the rumble. And in a lot of racing games, the rumble really adds an extra dimension to your gaming experience. Now it's not essential, but it's really a pleasant feature to have. And out of all the gaming categories, it's the one where I appreciate the rumble the most. However, once again, a positive point for this controller in this category, those programmable macro buttons for a lot of games is actually a lot more comfortable to use than the actual trigger buttons at the top, just because of the way you have to hold the gas down often while you're playing. Trust me, once you get used to throwing Koopa shells with those macro buttons, you're never going to want to go back to those trigger buttons. So overall, if you're a huge fan of racing games, this can be an excellent choice for you as a main controller. So now overall, that gives these Power A controllers an overall score of 44.5 out of 55, making it one of the higher scoring controllers we've tested so far. Basically, it means that this is pretty much a pretty good deal for anyone who wants to save a few bucks off of the Pro Controller. However, some final thoughts on these controllers. Before you decide to pick one up, I would say you have to ask yourself three major questions. Number one, what are the primary gaming categories I play in? And if so, please choose your D-pad accordingly. Secondly, can you live with the fact that these use AA batteries? As I said, I actually prefer it because when I'm on the move, like on a trip or something, it's easier to carry around, you know, three packs of AA batteries then to find a spot to recharge your controller when you're on the go. But that's me, that's a question you have to ask yourself. Price-wise for these controllers, depending on the model you're getting and if they're on sale or not, you're saving somewhere between $20 to $30 off of the standard Pro Controller. And you really have to ask yourself, do I prefer having those programmable macro buttons or do I rather have my haptic feedback, my NFC compatibility and my built-in battery? Now, obviously, the choice isn't going to be the same for everyone. For example, if you're an FPS or action game player, I would say that so far, this is my preferred controller over all my tested controllers. However, if you're a fighting game specialist, there are a few better models out there. And if you check my other reviews, you'll find them pretty quickly. And as I said earlier, and just as a final thought on this controller, it's really too bad that Powerade didn't pack in maybe one or two extra features that it was missing. Because if they did, even if this controller was maybe five or ten bucks more, it would really knock it out of the park and make it really a better controller, in my opinion, than the actual Pro Controller from Nintendo. Like, just throw in Turbo and traditional Rumble, not even haptic feedback. I would easily choose this controller probably over the standard Pro Controller. 
But overall, if you're looking at picking up a wireless pro controller, this is a very solid choice. And the aesthetics on some of these controllers are just amazing. Now, just a quick reminder before we go, if you've got to this point in the video, I hope you drop a like and you don't forget. Number two, subscribe if you aren't already and don't forget to activate the notification bell so you know when all my videos come out. The links, like I said, are down below. If you have any other questions about the controller, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. I try to answer as many of the questions as I can. And as usual, I hope I'll see you all in my next video.